Okay, and we're live. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Colleen. Hi, Anthony. Welcome hi to the fifth episode of The Educators versus VR. If you're watching this live, um, so I'm Chris. I'm based in sunny East London right now. If you're watching this in the future, just know that sun in London exists. It often <laughs> happens in June, and June is a great time to come uh, to come and visit. Um, normally, I'm the CEO of BodySwaps, which is a uh, software for learning soft skills in VR. But today, um, I almost won't talk about BodySwaps and instead spend a lot more time listening to Colleen and Anthony, uh, who are pioneers when it comes to mixing technology and education. The topic uh, for today is um, from innovation to transformation, making VR happen in, uh, in education. And that's how it's going to work. So quick welcome and introduction uh, right now. It's going to be a lot less than 10 minutes. Then we will have four or five questions to Colleen and Anthony. Tracy, unfortunately, is not with us today. So to catch uh, Tracy, you will have to wait for the next episode uh, in September. And then we'll have a solid 15, 20 minutes uh, to take questions from, uh, from the chat from YouTube. So please don't hesitate. Uh, hello, and Sophie. If you have any questions, for example, uh, please don't hesitate to drop one and uh, we will select uh, the best ones. So as an introduction, um, I wanted to talk about what's happened a little bit in the last nine years and, and kind of how to move along the adoption curve. So that's that picture. Some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, that's taken in 2013. Uh, at Stanford University in the Virtual Human Interaction Lab of Jeremy Balinson, where a lot of groundbreaking studies uh, have happened. Uh, it's a dedicated room. It's an expensive custom-made hardware, which is a ridiculously big cable that someone needs to hold. Um, that's, that's a picture of visionaries experimenting with VR. Now, 2022, uh, that's a screen grab taken from a training we did with um, one client this year. And what you have here is you have 16 learners at home on $300 headsets, uh, which they manage completely on their own uh, and taking a class. It's, you know, it's remote, it's engaging, it's affordable. So we're getting there. That's a picture still of, of early adopters, right? That's not totally scalable. And I would be lying to you if I told you that this was the smoothest ever. Now, the last picture is uh, taken from Sandwell College. So Sandwell College uh, is a college in the UK, in the Midlands, a further education college at its core here. And that's the plan for the immersive classroom that they're building now. So if you, if you were to zoom in, you would see a 3D printer, uh, you would see a keyboard cutting thing, TV, and two VR pods. And what I mean here is this is when VR reaches the mainstream. That's when it becomes the new normal. There's two VR pods alongside the rest. And so when every college in further education, wherever they're located in the UK, has a room dedicated to immersive learning in all its forms, that's when we'll have reached the mainstream. So that reminded me of this model uh, created in 91 by Geoffrey Moore, I believe, called uh, the chasm. And so the, what the chasm model says is, for any innovation, because obviously that was 91, so that wasn't about VR. For any innovation, you logically start with innovators, 2% of the population. Then the innovation is taken by early adopters. And then it doesn't smoothly transition to the majority. It either completely gets abandoned, say 3D TV, for example, or it actually uh, uh, really picks up, say, social media. And so that's what the discussion is about today, in my view, is how do we cross that, uh, that chasm? How do, we want, how do we go from people who want and love new things to people who want you know, complete uh, solutions uh, that, are, uh, that are truly, uh, truly convenient? Um, so I'm going to stop there. And now, Colleen and Anthony, you're going to tell me, well, first, where you think you are uh, personally on that, uh, on that curve and how, um, how to get there. So the first question that we are going to have today uh, is very simply, how are you using VR at your institution today? And I'm going to start asking the question uh, to Colleen. But Colleen, before we go, I'd like to introduce you. So Colleen Bielitz uh, oversees strategic initiatives and outreach for Southern Connecticut State University, 
where she's currently working on multiple XR projects, which you're going to explain in a moment. Uh, her goal is to bring the benefits of XR technology to the forefront of education whilst researching best practices and broader social, societal impacts. Dr. Bielit is the co-chair of the Education Committee for the VRIA, the XR Community Group co-leader for Educos, and a primary member of XR Women. Did I forget anything? <laughs> nope. No? I <laughs> all. All good. Um, all right, so let me bring your presentation. Um, you have five, six minutes, and I will be very, very hardcore if you don't respect the time. <laughs> no, I got you. All right, so um, thank you, everyone. I have my slide up there. I am from Southern Connecticut State University, and I have a little B in the corner because everybody usually asks me, how do you say your last name? So it's B Litz, so that try I tried to make it nice and easy. Um, we have a number of initiatives that uh, we're you know, planning on using AR and VR. We just launched our Center for um, Teaching and Learning. Actually, I think I just jumped ahead of slide, didn't I? Um, at, at our university. Uh, and uh, through this, we have uh, a number of XR uh, you know, initiatives that we're bringing into different disciplines. So we are leading autism research program, and we've been looking into studies on uh, how virtual reality may provide a new uh, non-invasive therapy for autism. And we're working to build a program to assist learners who have difficulty with social communication and behaviors, right? Because we want to create that environment that allows them to privately practice their social skills and their behaviors where they feel safe before taking them out into the real world. Um, we have a number of researchers who are jumping into this area, uh, and that makes it really exciting for me. And that's the beauty of XR is that it can impact so many different fields. Uh, we have faculty members in computer science, some in world languages. I also uh, have another faculty member uh, who is working in therapeutic rec uh, recreation and adaptive sports. Um, so she's very interested in this. And then I also have a professor in archeology span uh, that I'm working with, and he's a lot of fun, uh, Dr. Uh, William Farley, because he likes to demonstrate what games get right and what they get wrong when they're recreating ancient buildings. And he even has his own YouTube channel, uh, which is video game archeology. span So here I've highlighted uh, his evaluation of the Uncharted series uh, that's popular with gamers. And then um, I am building also with uh, a coworker, Bozam Fear. We have an ed tech course that we used to use for teachers. And now I want to show te uh, students that are going to be teachers how to create lesson plans in XR. And uh, the Engage platform is one that uh, I love to use because it's easy to use. I know Steve Lewis, uh, I believe, is on here on this call as well. I saw him join. Uh, from the Engage platform, but it allows us to use different types of digital assets that they have available, different types of backgrounds. So that makes it really exciting using the Engage platform. And then this year, I'm also excited because there is a new uh, VR app. It's called Breaking Boundaries. I teach women in STEM. It's a first year experience. And I usually go over different uh, female scientists uh, and, you know, a lot ha people don't know about, especially the young women, because We've learned a lot about male scientists, not about uh, female scientists. So there's a new app called Breaking Boundaries. Uh, here you can, on the screen, I have uh, you know Marie Curie, but uh, Grace Hopper, Queen of Code, is also included. Katherine Johnson, very important to NASA uh, with her mathematics, and also uh, the wonderful Jane Goodall are included in this series. So I. Feel like that's very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and in the future, I'd like to incorporate programs like body swaps for our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So there's so many avenues to explore, and we're just at the beginning. And I hope I did all of that within my time, Chris. Um, yes, yes, you had all of time within you. And I, I wish you had more time because it's really fascinating that I, I would love to dig into into each of those um, in more uh, in more in, in more detail, especially the the notions of on that slide that we have here, the notions of embodiment and how you can you can identify in VR with characters from the past in a very special way by by interacting with them as opposed to learning about this abstract figure of, right. a, of a historical event. Yeah, um, and I will just one quick thing is this uh, app takes students into their environment, so they get to see Marie's lab and they get to see Jane Goodall's like hut in the 
you know, forest. So it makes it really exciting for students. Well, that, that sounds certainly a lot more fun than, uh, you know, however I was used to learn back in the days. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for that, Colleen. Um, I'm now going to move to Anthony Martin. Uh, Anthony is the Digital Innovations and Engagement Manager at Exeter College, that's in the UK. And Anthony is tasked with both the vision surrounding uh, the development of technologies like XR and the practical implementation and further development across the institution. So going from the vision to the actual scale. Uh, his aim is to demonstrate the potential for digital technologies that uplift and empower learners through immersive experiences, creating educational opportunities that otherwise simply wouldn't exist. Anthony is a technologist through and through, as you can see from his background, uh, but it's also driven by a considered sustainable and accessible application of technology in our society. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for tuning in um, this evening and, and taking time out of your, your days. Um, so it's a difficult act to follow with Colleen there and, and some of the ways that she's introducing the technology and, and VR in particular into, into our environment. And I guess similarly at Exeter College, we're, we're kind of on thinking about your adoption curve and where we are on, on that one, Chris. I think we're um, quite early in our journey and how we're sort of going through these technologies with the college. And I think we're just trying to find out the best applications and how we can bring lots and lots of different immersive experiences into the college. Um, we have quite fortunately put together a room as you were describing one of the other um, further education providers is, is looking at as well. So we have built a room where we're bringing in things like Scorpion chairs and like VR, and you'll see some of those on, on my next few slides. Um, and I think it's really about just giving that art of the possible kind of experience for us at the moment. So uh, on the screen, the first slide you can see there is actually my uh, team member, Rachel, standing in front uh, of, of our new building with um, a HoloLens. So she's holding out her hand and, and she can see a very different world from what we can see on the outside. And so it's about that interaction in the, in the kind of real and built environment as well for us. So um, one of the first ones, and it's it's not a deliberate name drop, but it is certainly a bit of technology that we're we're sort of utilising and exploring at the moment, which is the body swaps tool. So it is uh, with Chris's, and I promise you, I'm not paid for my uh, my sort of um, inclusion of this here. Um, but it, we're looking at the concept of using VR for virtual job interviews, effectively. So if you're not familiar with this technology, this is for us is something where. If I have a member of staff who can give some uh, mentorship or some coaching to our learners, um, they're able to do that one-to-one, -one, which is obviously quite a time-consuming activity. But when we look at something like uh, the Body Swaps tool and these virtual job interviews, I can have 20 students in one classroom with VR headsets all going through that personalized, tailored um, experience. And I think that for me allows me to do a lot more with my time. It means I as a facilitator or my team members or colleagues as facilitators can do a lot more in that space and, and really enrich that whole program. So that's really insightful one for us and I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, some of the other ways we've really started to look at this are in sports plays and strategy. So we're looking at 360 video presented back through VR headsets. Um, and this is really to, to help develop those, those sports science things, the, the academies uh, and really look at plays. You know, if you look at a video in 2D, you can see what's happening in front of you. However, if you look at it in the 3D or VR or XR environment, I can see the person running and chasing behind, which is maybe why the goalkeeper or another player took a certain stance or they took a certain um, action. And I think that is really where our sports guys in particular are, are really excited to look at the extra, you know, the extra depth of field, I suppose, that these kind of VR tech technologies can bring. So that's really exciting to see where that might, might play out. This one has been um, really inspired, actually. So this is lived experiences, and this is looking at uh, Alzheimer's uh, and how that has an impact on people's lives. So uh, we recently did some work with our healthcare students um, where they were able to step into the shoes of someone who suffers from Alzheimer's um, and see the world from their perspective. So you can see on screen here, there's a hole opening up in the ground in front of her. That's actually a puddle, but it's it's showing how the world is perceived differently. The the screen is shaking, the the um, the voices are muffled, so you can kind of really feel like you are that person. And that's been really uh, inspirational to the students to see that kind of experience. So as, as Chris introduced me, saying about these, these immersive experiences and, and things you can't experience in the real world, certainly you can't experience that Alzheimer's piece unless you, you have the condition. 
Additionally, it's not really very cost effective for us to send our students up to the International Space Station, but we can see it through VR. So this makes it much cheaper for, for us as a, as a project, but also to give those out of world experiences. And I think part of it is a learning element. Part of it is really about looking at future tech and what it can do. So mission ISS on the quest, for instance, is, is one of those experiences we've used quite heavily. Um, I'm very near time, Chris, I appreciate, so I will uh, rattle on through these last few. Um, our Scorpion chair, in, you can see in the background here, um, just about, but the main focus of this VR fitness and esports side is where esports might traditionally be sat down at desks playing games and everything else that goes with. The VR fitness side is showing that if you separate your mind and body and put yourself into uh, an immersive experience here. In this case, um, the chap on, on the machine is holding a plank. In, I think he did it for about 15 minutes in the end. Um, but if you go to the gym, you could hold a plank for about 30 seconds, many of us, I'll say for myself in particular. But holding it for three minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes it is obviously going to be much better for you in health um, terms, in terms of that performance increase. So there are huge benefits, I think, to this. And I'm really expecting to see these kind of technologies go into our gyms and into our um, uh, into our other venues around the college, but really heavily for sports, sports sciences. And the final one for me to mention is just about well-being, um, in particular for students and staff members, to be able to experience all of this, this immersive tech, to relax, to chill, to take some time out, um, and use that as part of the learning. You know, the better relaxed you are, the better frame of mind you're in, the better your learning, I think, is going to be. So I'm really keen to bring some of those experiences um, to the college as well. And we've started started doing that um, on our staff development days. Uh, and that's that's me. So hopefully I'm not too over time. No, it's it's uh, it's fine. Th thanks a lot, uh, Anthony. It's it's fascinating. I, I shamefully did uh, injure my leg playing a fitness game in, in VR, um, <laughs> which made my girlfriend call me the lamest guy ever to walk this earth. Um, but hey, fit one. So, you know, uh, you all in all, uh, all in all, it works. Um, thanks a lot for this. Um, I promise everyone no more slides for today. We're going to, I think we needed this to be visual. Now we're going to have more of a chat. And you two just mentioned, I think it counted like 11 different use cases of VR. Uh, and that's just two institutions. Um, we can all name dozens of institutions now using it. So there's there's a ton out there. I reckon it can be a little bit uh, overwhelming. Um, so here's the next question. What are the, if you had to sum this up, you know, what are the benefits of VR for teaching? Why would you go through the effort, both the financial and the time effort, to, well, to implement VR in your, in your institution? Uh, Colin, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, well, it was funny with the space station, because I've done that as well. And I have to say, I think there's, th I mean, there's a lot of different benefits, but there's three distinct areas and those are immersion, interactivity, and invisibility. Like through that immersion uh, hardware, we can leverage the stereoscopic imagery and spatial audio to create that illusion of depth and space. That if you haven't uh, gone on the space station, I have to say it's incredible because it feels like you can actually pull yourself and float through the space. Um, but through that, I could also place like a 3D beating heart in your environment and you would feel as if you're sharing the space with it, you know, as you watch the heart pumping in real time and seeing chambers open and close and you can move it around it and peer inside. So that whole immersive experience is one of the benefits. Um, another is the interactivity, which allows you to actively engage with the digital environments that are enabling responses to your movement and actions. And if you first put on a, you know, a Quest headset, uh, they have this little kind of tutorial to walk you through where it's all about movement and action, like ping pong balls and you're shooting airplanes. And so making it an interactive medium that could use your full body and encouraging creation and expression, I think that is another example. And uh, Anthony just highlighted even with like planking in sports, right? It's interactive and it's making you move and use your body. Um, and then the third is invisibility, right? Because XR uses 3D imagery and blends that digital with the physical. I mean, it breaks the bounds of physics often and enables you to visualize phenomenon that are invisible to the human eye. So just as an example, like if you're looking at microscopic particles or if you want to take a look at what a virus looks like and split it and see the inside and see it how it, how it attaches to a cell. 
that invisibility aspect gives us kind of superhero powers. So if I was to say uh, three benefits, those are the ones that come to me right off the top of my head. So immersion, interactivity, invisibility. Got it? Brilliant. Um, uh, Anthony, what do you have to add to, to this? I, I, I would absolutely agree with all three of those. I think they're, they're all val really, really valid points. I, I would have a couple more to throw into the mix as well. So I, I would put fun in there, which is which is another one. So um, I, I think there's a there's a lot to be said for bringing enjoyment and fun into our learning. You know, we don't need to be stuck behind a stuffy textbook. Um, some some cases we do, but I think there is a lot more we can do by enjoying these experiences as well. So if we can make some enjoyability come out from those, you know, the the, the sheer, um, uh, I suppose, the, the the joy, I suppose, of putting yourself in front of um, a, an anatomical uh, model of some sort, so you can see the human body and you can pull through all the layers and, and sort of explore how everything is pieced together in in in, in a vr world you actually you couldn't do that in in a um in the physical world or at least not not easily and not without incurring some sort of discussions around ethics so i think there's there's the fun element of being able to do things that you can't do and you couldn't experience which also for me ties into the the wealth of experience as well so my, my second point is really about the the creation of things that you can't do in real life so absolutely i can't send everybody to space and that's that's something that's very difficult to do i can't ethically you know look at the human body in in the way that we would want to necessarily in learning at least not not in modern modern times so i think it gives you the the opportunity to bring those experiences to to light um and, and i i think it does open up that that world of things actually that are completely outlandish and and, and aren't aren't of, of you know current times and they are looking at things in a very different way for the future and i and i'm really excited about how we can open up those possibilities going forward so i i think there are an immense number of benefits um and it's really about finding the right i think finding the right application for you in your in your education and your in your lessons effectively so you thanks you mentioned the, the this idea of the right application um are there any wrong applications is there is this stuff that VR can't do or shouldn't do? Because um, I don't want us to be the evangelist saying it's the best thing since uh, sliced bread. What's sure? Where, where where do we draw the line as as educators? I think it's it's important that we we create some ground rules. I, I think, and there's there's a danger there's a danger with any any kind of new experience. Um, you know, if we look at how we use our mobile phones, for instance, there's an element of addiction to that that scrolling and 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 how serotonin is is then dispensed, and, and we get those little rewards for for accessing content. And I think the danger is if we bring just bring that wholesale into the VR space, we we create another potentially addictive experience. So I think there's a way we use technology and, and VR, which is really important. There are certainly some things that I think are are better for it. So learning experiences, taking yourself on a virtual field trip, traveling through time, you know, walking with dinosaurs, those kind of things. Again, you can't you can't do that. I think they're very much appropriate experiences. I think I, I don't know. I think things that maybe replace the positive things in real life um, and the things that you can realistically do. I'm not so sure that we should necessarily do those. And I hope that makes sense um, because I think there's a value in, in this human connection in doing things in real life still. So I wouldn't necessarily want to see all of our socializing done in a VR platform. I would like to see that done in real life still. But there are obviously mm -hmm. lots of things that I can do in VR that are well worthwhile. Thanks, Anthony. Dr. Bilitz, now that I know how to pronounce your name, what do you have to add to this? Well, I totally agree with Anthony. Um, we still have a number of hurdles, obviously, to overcome. I mean, we still have data and privacy issues that we're even dealing with, you know, using computer technology and our cell phones and, uh, and you know, VR and AR play right into that as well. We got to protect our information. Um, it, I feel the benefits do outweigh the negatives, but there are still friction points that we have to get over and, you know, get around. It's some, in some instances, even just the headset is still so big and bulky like that. <laughs> That's like one of the hurdles we have to overcome. But, you know, just like the cell phone, you know, when it first started was this big bulky thing and used to be tethered. I feel like, you know, we're on that exponential, you know, line straight up mm -hmm. and that things will change quickly. And uh, I know we have a lot of smart people that are looking out um, to make sure that we overcome those hurdles. Uh, that you know that are in place right now 
great. So, so, so to summarize everything you just said is there's as a as a teaching medium, learning medium, it, it has properties unlike any other in terms of fun, engagement, of of immersion, of understanding of memorability. Um, but that doesn't mean that it should replace necessarily the the, the existing, but rather uh, a, a, a complement. Maybe before we move on to the next question, one one follow up is. What's the role of the educator with with VR? Is does the educator have to become a a you know a hardware VR specialist, or is this someone else's role who's going to help the educators? How do you see the 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 the, the HR map, so to speak, as an institution when it comes to VR? Um, I'll jump in, Anthony, and then I'll let you take it uh, sure. because you're more on the te the tech side. So, I mean, I myself. Um, I'm into technology, but I'm not a computer programmer. I mean, I you know know just a little bit of code. So I'm actually educating others and bringing them into the world and kind of to follow up on that previous question, you know, I'm showing them the benefits of using the technology, not having them just use the technology for the sake of using the technology. And I think that there's going to be content shepherds uh, in this space that help others and kind of bring them into it. It's still unknown for a lot of people. They're still unfamiliar with what XR can do and even what XR is and how to implement uh, you know, VR and AR in the classroom. So I think that uh, it'll take a while, but eventually we'll get there, but you don't have to you know, deeply know it. You just have to have a willingness to want to experiment and to use it in the right way. And to jump jump in on that one, I think from my point of view, the the um, there are definitely teachers and, and staff members who want to take on board these things. There are there are certainly the innovators and, and those amongst our teams and, and every college um, who who want to embrace the technology and look at the new technology and learn it for themselves. But there will undoubtedly be those that fit on the, the adoption curve again, the laggards who 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 don't necessarily feel comfortable adopting it or don't really want to. Um, I would say it'd be a bit, bit of a mix of both. I would I would see more, and probably in our institution, it's going to be more of a, a facilitator role. So somebody would facilitate that technology, much as you would have a, a technician in a science lab, for instance, who can help those experiences be built. Um, but actually, the the teacher becomes the conduit of the information, I suppose, or the conduit of the experience. So I would see that the teachers, tutors, and educators um, are, are really the I suppose the tour guides in those virtual experiences, or they might be, um, like you say, shepherding people through a, a particular area within VR. That, that's kind of how I think I think it will be adopted, at least initially. Longer term, I don't know. I, I think as they become more prominent, as you know, as we get them down to size and we fit our VR headsets into something the size of our, our glasses, you know, then we have a very different world that it becomes much easier to adopt this tech. If it's already put onto our mobile phones, then um, where that is the interface, I, I think the adoption curve will will you know steepen even more. I think it'll be much quicker to adopt those kind of things um, once we're away from the big goggles. And after two years, still not unmuting myself. <laughs> speaking speaking of learning curves, um, so that that's a good segue to the next question, which is about the, the M word, uh, the metaverse. Um, let's let's imagine that indeed, you know, in, in maybe it's Apple, maybe it's it's Meta. I don't know, but in in a couple of years, we have the form factor has been has been solved. Um, do you do you feel the metaverse is going to be integrated into teaching? Or do we integrate teaching into the metaverse? Is you know, do you have headsets in the classroom, or the classroom is in the headset? Who wants to go first? Do you mind if I jump in on that one? I think if if I may. Um, so I have some quite strong opinions on this, and I probably ought to mute my microphone while I go on and rant about <laughs> the, the sort of next few minutes. But um, I, I think how we look at the metaverse, it comes back to how we should use this technology appropriately. Uh, I, I have very strong thoughts that, that we really do need to look at that as as a institutional piece and societal piece to see how we should be bringing VR into our world. My, my view and my vision I, uh, on my horror, I think, is a potential to go down the route of, of Wally, where we all end up sitting in chairs with our, our sort of soft drinks and, and leaning back and, and engaging with the world that way. That's my fear, but I don't think it necessarily has to become that. But I think our controls are the things we put into place. 
I would like to see that it's it becomes, I think in this these two options, um, teaching becomes integrated into it in some way, or we we oh sorry, we invite people from the metaverse into our teaching experiences, I suppose. Um, that there is a separation between the two and we don't have to go through VR and sort of walk down the virtual street to get to our virtual class to then to then engage. I think I see it still as experience driven in, in the education sense, rather than seeing our institutions as a, as a building on the virtual high street. Um, but I, I could be proved wrong. That, that, that's interesting. Before you answer, Kuli, I just want to bounce back on what you said. There's, um, there's a, when you go on the ISS station or when you, you experience what it's like to have Alzheimer's, for example, you, you, you're essentially experiencing something that's, that's impossible for you to experience in real life, or at least in that, in that, that moment in time. Um, that's on one side. On the other side, you have, you have experiences that are looking to recreate the classroom, the campus, the streets. Um, is, is, do you feel this is the wrong way of approaching the medium, or do you think it's the right way because the medium needs to feel like the real thing? Um. I don't. I don't really know how best to answer it. If I'm, if I'm honest, and that sounds like a bit of a cop out, but um, I, I think for me, yes, there is the immersion piece, and, and I think the bricks and mortar buildings, and certainly we have online courses, and we have distance learning, and, and and so on happening as well. So a metaverse could facilitate that in a much more you know engaging way. You put your lectures in through your your goggles and, and engage through lecture that way, and then you don't have to travel to university or college. Um, there are potential sort of benefits there. I. I just think it comes for me, it comes back to that still being able to engage with your peers and, and being able to engage more more with people around you still. And I think I prefer the experience, uh, something you can go into. I think, you know, whilst you're in the space station, effectively you're having that experience and the danger element has been removed from it, really. That's that's what you've taken away from from what would be experienced in the real world is, is the danger and the cost. Um, much like you would have... Uh, if you went deep sea diving in the same VR experience, or uh, if you were to in interact with um, high voltage electric cables, let's say there's some kind of splicing activity you're learning in, in the VR world, you're taking the danger away. Whereas I, I think uh, to do those in the real world, you'd obviously be inherently likely to, if you get it wrong, uh, obviously cause yourself injury and so on. That's, that's the richness of it. But I, I think the engagement piece about how we do it, I don't know, I, st I still come back to the wanting a bricks and mortar classroom, I think, for some of it, uh, which is very odd for a technologist to say. That's interesting. Colleen, what's your view on that? Well, I, you know, I feel there's a number of elements that are converging to create this new space. You know, the metaverse isn't built yet. Um, and Gartner has a great piece which lays out uh, the different elements of it, which range from uh, digital currency, non-fungible tokens, digital assets, <laughs> natural language processing, social entertainment, uh, social media, all of those are coming together, and that will be the metaverse, that space that ties them all together to create this unified, immersive experience. And as educators, we should be preparing our students for that world, and they should be familiar with all of these terms. And um, as much as I feel with Anthony that uh, I would like, you know, us to kind of bring the metaverse into the classroom, I believe with uh, Gen Alpha which, you know, they've been born in 2010, they'll, be born, they'll go to 2025, there's 2,800,000 2, of them being born every week. They will, they are the first 100% digital generation and they are living their lives through social, you know, uh, media right now and games like uh, Roblox and Minecraft. So I have a feeling that eventually um, we'll be integrating our teaching into the metaverse and not vice versa. Although I don't want to do away with the bricks and mortar. Um, you know, I have no idea what this uh, new world is going to be, but they're definitely digital learners um, and their world is online. Very interesting. Um, th thanks a lot for that. Enough of the metaverse. Uh, let's go back to practical stuff. Um, and a very, very simple question. Um, there may be some people today in the audience who haven't started yet. Um, what's, you know, what's the gold advice that you would give someone who wants to start? What are the, maybe some of the mistakes that you've made and you wish you, you, you knew of beforehand?
Who wants to go first? Sorry, uh, I'll jump in again if, if, yeah, if, uh, if um, that's okay. Uh, because we've been doing some of these quite recently, I've got uh, probably quite a few, but the, the single biggest piece, I think, would, would be not to underestimate the amount of time you need to invest um, to start off with. And I don't want to say that to deter you because it should, it really shouldn't, but um, to understand how much time it takes for a student to induct themselves into the VR world. You know, this is a very, except for our digital natives and those who are really used to using this technology, for most of our learners, this is a very new experience. So expect to have that 10 minutes of playtime while they familiarize themselves with a very strange, strange world. Um, and tied to that is also how you manage that classroom space. I think it's really important as, as an educator, I've received some training on this as well, um, to, to look at telling people how you're going to interact with them while they're wearing their headsets. So, you know, no sudden loud noises or you're going to be in the room whilst that experience is taking place. So they feel safe that they are in control of that. To talk to them about motion sickness and, and you know, the kind of things that they should expect. Um, and to give them some outs or to tell them how to use the devices, maybe even an instructional video or something before you let them into that, but expect them to have that, you know, 15 minutes of playtime to familiarize before you even start your your lesson, whatever it is you want to cover. Um, that's been my probably single biggest um, lesson learned, I think, with starting off with this. You can't go straight into it. Great, thanks. Yeah. I think that's solid gold advice, all right. Um, and the other piece that I would give is to connect with somebody already doing the work, right? Because somebody like Anthony can tell you, here's the things that you need to look out for. And everyone in this space is so generous of spirit and with their knowledge, uh, everybody feels it's big enough for everyone. And I know that many of us are willing to assist anyone that's looking to uh, jump into the space. Um, you could reach out to me, I'll connect you with others. I'm on the leadership team for XR Women. It's free to join. So if you're a woman or an ally and you're interested in XR, uh, please visit xrwomen.com. And I'm on the ed committee, uh, as Chris said, for you know uh, VRARA and Educause. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'll put my, uh, my uh, QR code up at the end, but connect with somebody already doing the work. I feel like they can be your best guides because they've kind of already gone through some of the hard things. Great. One what, what of the things you, you mentioned, Anthony, was um, um, you said it's important to find what content works for you. And we've had a few, we have a few questions on YouTube, which is, oh, can you give us the link of the, uh, the archaeology and video games channel? Can you give us the link of the, the Alzheimer's experience? How, as, a, as an educator, where, you know, where do I go to find the content that is good for me? Is Ooh, there, do you feel question. that there's an issue there in the, in at the moment in industry? I I think there is. Um, it's getting it is getting better. It's getting so much better and very very quickly as well. Um, uh, for me, I think a lot of my resources actually are shared with me by others. They they find something. They think, oh, can we can we do this? I'd love to bring that in. Um, and I think it's very easy to get these experiences, and they can obviously contribute costs, but there are a lot of things you can do for free. There are lots of resources out there as well. Um, I'll answer that question actually about the dementia one that I saw pop up at the same time, if that's okay, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. So the tool that we've used is simply a video, a 360 video recorded by the Alzheimer's, uh, I think it's the Alzheimer's Society or Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, it's a 360 YouTube video. So you can find it on YouTube called A Walk Through Dementia. So your VR experience can be something as simple as that. So it could be a 360 video, but it's how you wrap your lesson and your, your education around that that makes it the immersive experience that it is. Um, other things, there are libraries of, of 360 and 3D and VR contents that are coming up. And of course, you've got the app stores for um, each of these kind of products to explore as well. Um, I think it's like any educator, if you're bringing those resources into your class, um, we would tend to watch through the YouTube video first or, you know, take the experience ourselves first before we throw anybody into it. I think that's probably quite an important one. So you don't find actually there's something you shouldn't be showing to your students halfway through. Um, so I would say whatever you do, whatever you find, experience it for yourself first as well. Um, but YouTube is a great source for these kind of things. Um, there are tools like some of those on the call. I, I won't name drop again, but there are tools that are out there as whole packages. Um, and there are obviously library items in, in like say in the stores that you can take advantage of as well um 
try them and see them. I think it's so it's such a new thing for so many people that I, I think you need to try an experience for yourself to see what works. Mm -hmm. And Colleen, where, where would you go to? Well, I have to say, I mean, just like Anthony, and I thought when Anthony said about all the time that you'd have to spend in XR, um, part of the time you have to spend is doing research. I usually find things by looking at others' research. So if there's a specific area, so just adaptive technology, for example, and I have a faculty member that wants to get into that, what I will do is then I will go look up different types of journal articles and the research that's being done in that area and then take that. And if they happen to, you know, note which apps or programs that they're using, I will also look into those and kind of have it like here are the ones that are offered for free. There's a subscription price for this, but it could be offered to this many students. So it's a lot of uh, the same. It's you have to kind of search for. Uh, different applications and have people send you like, oh, this was really cool and stay on top of it yourself. I mean, I get a lot of the different uh, websites for XR, you know, the newsletters, just so that I can keep on top of everything. Because it is like drinking from a fire hose, especially when you first get started. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think actually just just one last quick point is um, go to some of the exhibitions, go go to the tech events, the 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 likes of the Bet Show in the UK and I think various others in, in the States and, and uh, all around the world um, or send an educator, send someone from your institution, get them to go and have a look, experience those those um, technologies and those experiences in the real world, in the VR headsets um, to see actually what they're all about, you know, get them to bring that back to your institution. That's how we found a lot of the things that we've saw um, and started using is from some of those events. Um, just seeing a little snippet of something being used can, can be a great inspiration to then research it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned the free resources like 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 YouTube. Um, obviously, you're all aware of, of the news and what happened in the US with the, with the Supreme Court. And someone resurfaced uh, on LinkedIn a 2015 360 documentary by Noni de la Peña, which was commissioned by uh, family planning in the US. And I go through a lived in experience of going to to a to a, a, a clinic and which I tried ye, ye, uh, yesterday and this is more powerful than 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 a two hour a lesson and that's a fantastic tool for the educator so um, look around and indeed there's a very very kind of tight community of VR educators on LinkedIn as well so everyone is very happy to point everyone else towards the the the, the, the good experiences. Um, I have a question going back to that that uh, adoption curve. Um, you as individuals are probably uh, uh, visionaries or at least early innovators. If you want to be, if you want to be humble, um, that's not the case. I reckon of everyone in your in your institutions. What are the biggest blockers that you have seen to go from you know POCs prototype towards something that is more more integrated? Um, I'll just jump in real quick. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, but I w like am the early adopter. I wanted to get things started in 2018, and it wasn't until after COVID <laughs> that people were like, hey, you know, let's talk about this. Um, and it's slow going, like getting headsets, getting funding, you know, because the headsets aren't cheap, especially the ones if you want to get into eye tracking or haptics and all of the different, you know, hardware and software, you know, it's pricey. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say, it, if you want to get into this, it's going to be, you know, a prove yourself, prove your worth, you know, apply for the funding. Um, and Unity actually just, uh, Unity with Meta actually just had a, a grant application that had gone out in the spring for like headsets and getting that set up. So there are, different uh, avenues that you could do just to dip your toes, even in the water. Um, but then you could, as you build on it, you could go for, you know, different types of grants, um, especially the bigger ones uh, like NSF grants, uh, but get your feet wet, apply for some things and then kind of prove your worth and the return on investment. But this is where the future is going. So you can make a claim for it for sure. You can show how uh, just the adoption rate has jumped in just the past two years. Great. Well, actually, uh, before you answer, there was a question from from Michelle on on YouTube. Grant funding, um, any any more insights 
on, on that, Colleen. You just mentioned one. I was wondering if you had more, more practical tips for Michelle here. Sure. Um, so NC WIT also is another one. That's the National Women in Technology, like as an, as an example. Um, there's uh, other type of VR uh, grants, but off the top of my head, um, you know, they're usually very small, but ed tech, a lot of different smaller ed tech grants that you could go for. Uh, see the community foundation in your area as well. A lot of times community foundations will uh, support smaller grants, especially if they'll have impact on uh, your local community. I, I know that someone, I have an example of uh, Kaiser Permanente, who, so obviously private company had a fairly sizable grant for uh, transforming, um, uh, um, transforming education in, in nursing using uh, using technologies so you have the government side of things uh, but also more often there are partnerships between employers and and and, and educators in terms of well, getting students better prepared for, for for the job they're going to have so keep an eye in that direction as well I guess similarly, I can answer that probably in in the UK context as well. Uh, I must admit, I'm I'm looking for these sources as well because I'd like to obviously secure a lot more funding than, than we have available to us. Um, I think there are obviously there are government initiatives and grants that you can you can find from time to time to take part in. Um, industry, absolutely, I think there are there are opportunities there to engage with employers, to engage with local industry, and and find ways of working together with them. Particularly for us, I suppose, in in further education and and higher education. Um, but I've also just made a note that there are other avenues like local enterprise partnerships um, where they are able to tap into sort of other funding um, or, or things like UFI and, and those other kind of grant schemes. But um, a lot of them you may find tend to fall down on if you are developing content for yourself more than if you just want to consume content and and, and bring those packages into, into your colleges, schools um, uh, and institutions and so on. So... Um, I would love to have more answers for you. I think on that one. It's it's um there's something that that, that you said, Colleen, and that's going to be the, the the perfect segue for for the conclusion around proving your worth. Um, and I think if we if we go back to to decide it, try and bring bring it all together. What have we discussed? We've said that. Um, well, first, there's a lot of ways to use VR in education. You gave 12 examples between the two of you. Uh, so there's, there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds today. Two, there are huge benefits to, to teaching in VR. Um, and when we say benefits, we're saying, you know, doing VR because it's innovative is not a benefit. Um, doing VR because it's immersive, because it's engaging, because it takes the danger away, because you can do impossible stuff. Those are, those are the benefits. Um, we're saying that there's a there's a macro long-term trend of the metaverse or the next generation of digital experiences, um, which is which is which is going to be how students learn, whether we like it or not. That's that's who they are, and that, that that's why we cannot not go for it. Um, and then and then we mentioned that when you start. Essentially, if I'm summarizing what you said, it's hard, and we need to rely on each other uh, as a as a as a community. Um, maybe one thing um, that will help is is trying to measure what matters. And you will always start small, um, and leveraging the data that you can get in VR or around VR to demonstrate that yes, you had to invest. X amount of money in the software and the hardware, in training facilitators, in booking a room, but it, it is all worth it. Because at the end of the day, when the, 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 the gimmick, the, the glitzy aspect of VR dies off and will, the learning performance is, is the only thing that, that, that remains. Um, and to give you an example of that, um, we worked with George Brown College. So we worked with an institution in Canada and they told us, we want to use VR to transform conversations about race. Uh, it's obviously a huge, huge challenge. Uh, it's a shame that it still exists. Let's do something about it. Maybe with VR, we can do something. So we created an experience with them. And when I say with them, the students did the voices. They looked at the script and told us whether it was poorly written. We work with experts from the college. So the software vendor steps back and says, you know, no, you guys, you know what you need for your institution. 
But then we, rather than measuring whether students you know, enjoy or didn't enjoy the experience, we try to go one step further. And in that case, we measure the confidence to apply real world skills. So, you know, what you see here is 23% of students were confident challenging others to reflect on their microaggressions before training. And that's 73% after. About a quarter were confident using strategies themselves to challenge microaggressions uh, directly. Again, 75% later. Does that mean that three times more microaggression and racist conversation are going to be challenged on a daily basis? Probably not. Obviously, the learning, you know, wanes off after some time. But does it mean that some conversations that wouldn't otherwise have been challenged are not going to be able to, to pollute the environment in a university? Certainly. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's putting the technology aside and, and you know, just moving the needle and, uh, and speaking of impact. And I think you've demonstrated with your examples that, um, that, that VR has the power to be uh, the most impactful uh, medium there is today when used um, in, the, um, in the right way. I'm looking at the chat. Um, if there's no more, no more questions, I have one last for you, which is simply, where can we find you? Uh, and is there any, any current projects where you would like the help from the community or any current projects that you, are, you have time to help the community with? I think you both on mute. Both yep. on mute. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Chris. I, I do love body swaps. I, I love what it could do. That's like one of those supernatural powers it gives you, right? It gives you the chance mm. to then swap bodies with somebody else and kind of view and, and see how you react to different things. So thank you for highlighting that at the end. Um, and if for anybody that needs me, I uh, thank you for having my uh, LinkedIn up there. Feel free to reach out, touch base if you have any questions. Uh, always here. Um, to help anybody that's, uh, you know, starting out or wants to partner in any way. So I appreciate that. And I thank uh, Anthony as well for being my co-panelist and our thoughts go out to Tracy. Hope she's doing well. Absolutely. And, and from my point of view as well, um, very similar to Colleen, you know, thank you everyone for, for taking part and then to my, my co-hosts on, on the session and um, conversation today. I think it's, it's really useful to be able to share this uh, and to have that conversation both sides. For me, um, absolutely get in touch. My LinkedIn details are up on screen there. Um, so so do feel free to to connect and engage. I will happily share um, and, and any tips and any tricks uh, or how we're implementing technology here. I will be starting a blog series up soon as well. So I'm hoping to sort of get a lot more information out there into the world about how we've gone about some of these things as well. Um, so it's not quite ready yet, but hopefully they'll be coming soon. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy to engage and, and share. So so please do do use that opportunity if, if you'd like to. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, if, you, if there are things you think that are useful in colleges that you'd like to sort of get and, and put out there, then then I'm also happy to entertain those ideas uh, and see how we might maybe try some things out or even work in, in partnership with some of you potentially. Um, so very open to ideas. Um, and I think I just want to leave one last comment, if I if I may, just around this this whole concept uh, of, of VR and, and, and taking tech forward. Um, you have the chance with this kind of technology just to sow a seed. And I think that's the most important thing we can do as educators in, in anything we try and teach anyone is, is if you can sow that little seed of inspiration and something that gives someone, um, you know, light something up in them so that they can take their, their future forward and, and look at maybe their career in a different way or a product they're trying to bring to market and launch. Um, I think VR is a really, really powerful way of, of bringing in those little lights, those little seeds of, of information, the little bits of inspiration, and you don't have to do much. I think a small exposure to this kind of tech opens some ideas and some doorways to things. And I think it's really worth embracing, even if it's something through you know Google Glass kind of headsets or the little cardboard headsets, those kind of things, even if it's something like that, it's well worth having a look at some of these experiences to see what they might do. Fantastic. Well, I hope I hope that gives you you know the the desire to to explore some more. Um, if you're wondering what the QR code is in here, it will take you to a form where you can leave your feedback, tell us what you what you like to hear about or who you would like to hear it from. Next time we'll have another episode uh, in September, 
and Jolie Colleen sex a lot. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I'm sure we'll chat uh, very soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all.